So first of all, thank you very much for coming. It's, you know, for some people it's been um, a long way to come. And it's difficult on a weekday. We know that. Weekends are easier. And is that better? <laughs> okay. So we build this today as a day for democracy. Um, I think everybody here remembers what it felt like on this day nine years ago. So it seemed to us an appropriate day to change direction completely, to shift away from this constant begging and being turned down and waiting and nothing happening to a new initiative. And the Sterling Directive, as you know, is the first ever instruction based on the sovereignty of the Scottish people in our own constitution and the rights, the democratic rights of the Scottish people in international law. So it's an instruction for the first time given by the people. Instead of, please, we demand, we're petitioning, we're marching to ask, it's we are telling you now, this is the instruction you have had repeatedly from the Scottish people, and which you, as well as Westminster, have ignored. And it's time for our Scottish representatives to make a choice. Either they answer to Westminster as sovereign and the final authority, or they choose to answer to the people of Scotland as sovereign and the final authority. And I'd like to quote Canon Kenyon Wright, who said some years after the claim of right for Scotland and the Scottish Constitutional Convention. He said that he thought often that those who signed a modern version, a reiteration of Scotland's claim of right, 1689, that they, many of them hadn't understood what they had signed. Either the people in Scotland are sovereign or Westminster is sovereign. It cannot be both. So today we laid that, not just a gauntlet, but that opportunity down for our re elected representatives to stand up and say, under the terms of the Treaty of Union, under the Scottish Constitution, and under the provisions of international law, we answer not to you, but to the people of Scotland and we will take that authority and we will act on it. And that is historic because it's the first time it's been done. So no matter how many of us there are, and there weren't that many on the steps of the post office in Dublin when the Dublin Pro Proclamation was read, what we've done today is historic. And it will build, and we will build from there. One of the important things now is to begin to understand what we have not been allowed to understand through all these years of colonization. What sovereignty means. What makes the Scottish Constitution different from the English one that's been imposed on us? What does it look like? How do we use it? We're starting, we're learning, we're moving now. Really important distinction, we need to stop talking about independence for Scotland as a nation. And that'll take a while because what we're really looking at is an independence that we can begin to take now, that we can begin to implement now. Independence of the people. One of the things Bruno said in a, uh, when I spoke to him, which has stayed with me, is you do not have an independent nation where you do not have an independent people. So we need to think about independence what it means, what would it mean now, what do we do now to reclaim that independence? And that goes hand in hand with sovereignty, with democracy, which is what actually sovereignty means. Democracy, demos, people, kratos, power, people power. There's no higher people power than the sovereignty of the people. And so we need to talk about claiming our identity, our independence, and withdrawing from the Union. That's it. That's what we're doing. We're looking for the way to withdraw from this Union. And what's the silver lining on this is that 
if we had gained independence as a nation and had become an independent nation state in 2014, we would have been really a continuity state. We would have been carrying on with the same institutions, the same power structures, the same relationship between the people and the government that we had already. And today we can all see how broken those structures are and how past their cell by date and how desperately we need real democracy, real people power, so that we can look to withdrawing from that union and creating a Scotland, creating a nation in which there is real people power, sovereignty. That we have an alternative, not, not an alternative to Scotland being subsumed as a nation and a state into the UK state, but an alternative to the kind of power and the kind of government that we have had up until now. And, and that has to be a real opportunity for us. We have to learn that too, because we know nothing. We live in a, a, a bubble in, 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 in the UK or the UKs. And we don't, we aren't exposed to international realities. What, what would that look like? I mean, how do people do that? What do you do to put that in place? What does it mean? We have no experience of anything except this thing we are told is democracy that means we go to a ballot box every five years and vote for a different flavor of the same kind of government. We have no experience of anything else. So here today, to give us a sense of that and to answer questions, and, and, and show us a bit about what we're, the journey we are now embarking on, is Bruno Kaufmann, who is, uh, as he describes himself, a reporter and supporter of democracy. He's tra been traveling the world for decades, for many years, supporting democratic movements. He works with the Initiatives and Referendums Institute of Europe, with Democracy International, he is a reporter for the Swiss Broadcasting Company. Um, and, and he is an indefatigable and tireless observer, supporter, reporter of robust forms of democracy. So we're very lucky to have him here, very, very grateful that he agreed to come. And I'm looking forward to learning from him as much as I'm sure everybody else is here. So thank you very much indeed, Bruno. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Thank you, all of you, to uh, helping me doing my job. I'm very, very pleased to be here, and I want to, uh, today, as I followed your activities this morning, and I heard a lot about what you are doing, uh, applaud you for your self-confidence in this difficult situation. Self-confidence to uh, not beg, but to instruct uh, the people of Scotland, Scotland, by the people, for democracy. I will not talk so much about independence, I will talk about democracy. And I, I also want uh, uh, to, to say that this is, in fact, the third time I'm having a democracy event in a church or in a religious building. Uh, the other two times were once in, in, uh, in Uruguay, in a, in a very nice Catholic church on the, on the seaside, uh, where the people uh, of this city uh, were discussing a new city constitution. And the second time was in a temple in uh, Taiwan, in Taitung, where indigenous people uh, were fighting for their rights. And both Uruguay and uh, Taiwan are, are, in a way, promising democracy. So having this event here this afternoon in a church, I think it's a good sign for the promising and the prospects of democracy in Scotland. I'm a, a big uh, friend of, of Scotland. I'm uh, as often as I can using a train coming up here. I will also tonight again take the train uh, from Edinburgh because I think it's a good way of traveling. Uh, a couple of years ago, I was even taking the train from Torso to Kyle of Lockelch and then from Malik to, uh, to, uh, to Fort William. So uh, it's, a, it's a great way, but also trains, as you can see, always minding about the gaps. Yesterday I was together with some of you 
And so when we wanted to go back, the train was cancelled. So we couldn't take the train, but we minded the gap and took the bus back. It was also, and it is always for me, interesting to, when I'm in a country, to go to different places and to see how democracy works or doesn't work, which challenges are there local people. So yesterday we had the chance to see a very important struggle in Aberdeen, in the harbour, uh, in the Fitzpatrick Park, where the people of this part of Aberdeen, and the people of Aberdeen, but the, uh, the city part, Torrey, uh, really are under big pressure about losing their space of living, their space of life quality, and how the people have little or very few opportunities to make their voices heard in a binding sense. But it was very interesting because, as always in this type of cases, you see an open world of possibilities. And uh, as I said this morning, I was very pleased to see you uh, giving this instruction, sharing uh, your, 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 your proposal, your initiative uh, with the public, with the, uh, the people of, of Scotland. And I think, as Sarah said, it's very often, it's never the end, it's only the beginning of a, of a long process. So, why I am here, why I'm here with you, why I, I, I got these expectations to share uh, about democracy, about uh, sovereignty, about the value of citizenship with you. Why is uh, this something I can share with you? I'm, uh, as uh, Sarah said, I'm a journalist, I'm uh, uh, 57 years old, uh, I am the father of two daughters, and my wife here. We have we had some when we moved. We did these pictures on the same on the on the on the same stairways. So I I, I grew up in Switzerland. I live in Sweden, and uh, as uh, Sarah also has said, I I'm very often traveling because I'm as a journalist try to uh, to see and to share with people around the world how their freedoms, how their sovereignty looks like. But this is a place where I'm living in Sweden. Uh, it's a place called Arboga. It's a very small place, just 10,000 people. And we have a nice river. And uh, this river, in fact, has an interesting story because it's a river where many things started in Sweden because it's at a strategic place. And today this river has its own uh, um, uh, environmental personhood. With a, with a council protecting the river, the interest of the river, and that's one of my uh, small roles in Arboga is to be a river councillor. But Arboga is also uh, uh, an important place because in 1435, this place was the first place of the Swedish parliament to convene. So some people would say Arboga is the place where Swedish democracy was born. But as I've, I've said, I'm, I'm not from Sweden. I'm born in Switzerland, in a very small country in the middle of, 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 of Europe, uh, so small that you have to make a big circle around it so you can find it. It was, in fact, I was 16 years old when I first time saw the sea. So I'm a really landlocked person. Still today, I'm not a big fan of uh, lobsters and such things. Switzerland is a small country. It's in the middle of Europe. It has a very interesting history because it's a country uh, where we had never a king, never a dictator, never a unified central power, and this has been very instructive for the development of democracy in Switzerland. Four times a year in Switzerland, we get the chance to vote on issues on the national, on the regional and on the local level. Every citizen in Switzerland has about 30 to 40 binding decisions to make every year. And this is certainly something which educated me, which informed me at a very early stage that this right, this possibility to be a decision maker uh, is constitutive for the citizenship understanding. So. Since I'm uh, eligible to vote in Switzerland, I have voted more than 1,000 times in elections and in referendums and in initiatives. So this practice has been very important. Secondly, I have uh, been 
very interested in these issues from an early age on. So I studied political science, peace and conflict studies, and I developed a lot uh, of, let's say, research around how direct democracy can be also used and developed, not only on the local, on the regional and national level, but also on the transnational level. My thesis was about transnational direct democracy in Europe, and we, together with many others at that time, 30 years ago, the idea of the European Citizens Initiative. It's a tool which gives all EU citizens the right to propose legislation to the European Union if you gather one million signatures together. Thirdly, uh, my job has from a very early age on been a reporter, a journalist for news magazines and since 30 years now for the broadcasting company uh, where I'm at the Swiss broadcasting company, the Northern European correspondent covering the region from Greenland to Lithuania, from Finland to Denmark, the Faroe Islands, not so much Scotland, unfortunately. But also I'm the global democracy correspondent for Swiss Info, which is the BBC International, the international service of the Swiss broadcasting company, where we are reporting in 10 languages uh, about what's going on around the world with a relationship to Swiss issues. So I'm covering basically democracy stories from around the world, and I will also talk about Scotland and also what's going on just now here. And fourthly, this has been uh, something which I'm not uh, uh, had an idea about to do, is I also have held different elected offices. Uh, by, for instance, being elected as a, a member of a city government in Sweden for eight years where I was responsible for elections, democracy, and many other things. But this, of course, gave me also a lot of insights into what it means to be a government person. Now, on this Democracy Day 2023, what do I want to achieve with you, what do I want to discuss with you, which questions do I want to address with you. I have three questions I would like to uh, put forward and three questions we maybe together also can find answers to. The first question is very easy. Why should Scotland become a country of happy losers and how? Second question. Why should Scotland's local governments become much stronger and how? And thirdly, and why and how can Scotland become a land of which its people can enjoy a genuine democratic sovereignty? Happy losers, strong local governments, genuine sovereignty, democratic so sovereignty. The happy loser thing is something which uh, I'm very gladly share because I really feel in the depths of my, my, my democratic behavior as a truly democratic loser, a happy loser. That means, I'm, I've said, I have been able and privileged to be uh, uh, an active voter, participant in political decision making more than 1,000 times in my life. I'm a citizen in, Sw in Switzerland, in two different states, in two different cities, on the national level, I'm also a citizen of Sweden and of the European Union in many different constituencies, in many different instances, and I must say I lost most of the votes and referendums. And I still like it. I will tell you a little bit more how this comes. Switzerland is a very special country, like many countries are very special. Switzerland is not a nation state. It's a country constituted by many different people, many different nations, many different religious beliefs, many different languages, and it has been evolved over many, many years. The language derivation of Switzerland uh, looks, uh, in a way, uh, quite diverse into directions. In the Northeast, most people speak some form of German. Germans wouldn't say we speak German, but we speak uh, also German. Um, the Swiss dialects, the different Swiss uh, dialects could be written languages because the Swiss never agreed to have a common uh, Swiss language in German. They just took over the, uh, the, the German ones from Germany. So this is our common language, but nobody's 
in fact, in Switzerland. So when I went to school, I had first to learn German in school. Then we have French in the western part, closer to France, uh, which is more uh, similar to how a language is spoken in France. And we have in the southern part, uh, we have Italian, uh, which is uh, uh, one of the states. And then also in the eastern part, a, a language called Rato Roman, which is spoken by about 50,000 people. But all these four languages are equally uh, uh, enabled on the national level as equal languages. That means each of these languages is e equally used when it comes to legislation. Each of these languages can be spoken in uh, official uh, uh, contexts and in the Sw uh, Swiss parliament basically you don't have translation but everybody expects all the others to be uh, understood. Switzerland is also a country of many local governments. In fact, here you see a, a current map. This is changing all the time. It's about 2,200 municipalities or local councils at this moment, which have a lot of powers, which have a lot of money, you can say, and also play an important role in everyday life. So the question is, how did Switzerland develop its specific form also of direct democracy in uh, its history? And there are uh, quite a, a lot of myths around that in Switzerland. And it's very important to understand what direct democracy in the Swiss context means and what it doesn't mean. In fact, you can say that the Swiss political system is simply much more than a representative government. Because in many countries, representative democracy means that you give away your vote every four or fifth year, and then you have to wait until the next election. But representative democracy, in its sense, is of course a democracy where not just the votes are given away, but the voices are kept on a daily basis. Representative democracy in Switzerland is based not only on direct democracy, and I will tell you more about what that means, but also on the federal system, which means that you have these different autonomous sovereign levels of government on the local, regional, and national level. And the political system in that way, you can say, is, is some form of a developed democracy as it combines the key principles of modern representative democracy, which is the rule of law, the separation of powers, the delegation of powers, and direct participation. All these four parts are constitutive parts of a modern representative democracy and in some way quite well established in the Swiss democracy. But it's also important because it's always the question, how can you develop such a system? What is the history of it? And it's important to say that in the Swiss case, Switzerland didn't invent federalism, direct democracy. In fact, Switzerland was invented by these practices and principles. That's especially very important now because just this week, on the 12th of September, we celebrated the 175th anniversary of the birth of the Swiss Constitution. And this was done by referendum. That means on the 12th of September, 1848, the eligible men at the time only voted in favor of a new constitution which changed the pre-modern, pre-democratic traditions and forms of state in Switzerland to the modern one. And that was, you could say, one of the first such constitutions in Europe and the world which were developed and decided by referendum. Because before Switzerland uh, uh, was a modern state, there were quite different, very unclear uh, forms of states, of cities, of regions, different kinds of, of more or less paternalistic forms of government, even small, uh, um, uh, small, mo small monarchies. But at that time, in the 1830s, 1840s, you can say that that Switzerland was on the brink of a civil war, and in fact there was a civil war in 1846, but it only lasted for 21 days, and you can say there were less than 100 casualties. 
because one of the generals, in fact, the Protestant leader, General Dufour, he said at that time to his soldiers, don't kill the, our enemies because we have to live together with them in the future. Quite a wise military leader, I would say. But the inspirations of both federalism and, and direct democracy weren't developed in Switzerland at all. In fact, there is this story about the US history of federalism, which in itself was inspired and instructed by the uh, Native American Iroquois people who developed a form of federalistic system in their, uh, in their, in their lands. And when it comes to direct democracy, one of the big inspirators was a Frenchman during the French Revolution, Marquis de Condorcet, who in 1793 proposed and introduced the first forms of initiative and referendum. And these ideas, as they were not successful in France, these ideas then inspired the Swiss states and peoples to introduce that in 1848. So, again, the 1848 Constitution was based on direct democracy and federalism, which is based on a federal ID of three parallel, uh, equal forms of sovereignty and forms of uh, decision-making, where the local level decides about the most things and those who are closest to the people, the cantonal level, have their own constitutions, they have another set of of, of competencies and the federal level only does those things which the local and regional level doesn't want to do. So the federal level, the na national level in Switzerland is only allowed to do things the, the municipalities and the states don't want to do. And uh, for instance, and this is very important, every 15 years in Switzerland we have a mandatory national vote if the people still want to pay taxes to the national level. So the national level has to do a good job. So we have one confederation, 26 states, and 2,222 municipalities. And, this, and the lawmaking process is, is very much informed through that. We have both on the national level and on the state level, we have small governments of maximum seven to eight, nine ministers, and they are always acting as a collective. That means even if there are ministers from different parties, they have always to act as, as a collective and they're responsible vis-a-vis -vis the parliament in their, in, their, in their competencies. And it's not like that, that uh, the government in itself uh, is vis-a-vis -vis an opposition in parliament, but the government in itself is gathering most of the parties which are in Parliament. For instance, on the national level in Switzerland, the four parties in government, they bring together about 80% of the Parliament vote. And that has a lot to do with direct democracy as we are experiencing and developing it in Switzerland since many years. This, as I said, has been a, a birth element of Switzerland, that Switzerland was born by referendum, but as such, the forms of direct democracy had to be developed again by the people against, you can say, the interests of the elected representatives. In 1848, only the mandatory vote on constitutional change was introduced. It was also introduced that if you have a decision on the national level, it's not enough to have a simple majority. You need a majority both at the popular level, but also the majority of the states to be in favor. That means sometimes we have a vote where 53% of the people say yes, but not the majority of the um, people in the, in the states. This protects the interest of the smaller states and also of the minorities. But in 1874, we had another revolution in Switzerland where people uh, protested against especially the corporate interests in the parliament. And at that time, we introduced the most important uh, you could say, uh, legal uh, development at that time, the, the, the referendum, uh, popular referendum, which means that every law which is decided in Parliament, every law is the subject to a possible referendum, which means that when the law is decided in Parliament, 
there are 100 days for the people of Switzerland to gather at least 50,000 signatures to put it to a national vote. And uh, this means that there is a check on the decisions of parliament on a continuous basis, because after all, most laws in Switzerland are not put to a national referendum because, and why is that? The legislator, the parliament, the, the representatives, they do such a good job that you don't find 50,000 people, which are about 1% of the electorate, to put it to a national vote. Which also means that the representatives have to talk when they are designing a law with all interested stakeholders in the country in order to integrate their viewpoints at an early stage, again, to avoid a referendum. So in fact, this instrument of direct democracy makes representative democracy much more representative by its heart. And that's a very interesting factor because very often we hear that direct democracy undermines representative democracy. The contrary is, in, is the fact. And there was, was another big reform in 1891 which not only allowed the people to question and to check decisions of parliament, but also to come up with their own proposals. In fact, with ideas and proposals for a new constitutional amendment. That means you have to gather 100,000 signatures within 18 months to uh, propose a new constitutional amendment, which then is put to parliament. The parliament can say yay, yay or no. The parliament and the government only can advise the people. They cannot decide over the opinion of the people. It's the people who are the, the decision maker in these issues when it's put forward as a popular initiative. And I think that's a very important factor. In Switzerland, in fact, no parliament, no government can put an issue to the people for voting. It's not possible to just say, we make a law about having a vote about joining the EU. No, this needs to be done by the people themselves, or it is enshrined in the constitution when there is a change coming up. Again, this tool enables the people not just to be decision makers, but also to be agenda setters. And this is very important, and that brings me to my initial important experience with the tool of direct democracy in Switzerland, when I, in the 1980s, was very active in the peace movement, as a very young person, we had in Switzerland, at that time, a very, very big and strong and very intimidating uh, uh, national security force uh, called the army. And it was very difficult to reform, for instance, to have alternative service, uh, to uh, discuss forms of how to behave in the military. Every, every time there was such a proposal to reform the army, it was, this is against the army and this is against the country. So a lot of young people together started a popular initiative for the abolishment of the Swiss army. And we had together 100,000 signatures within 18 months. And in fact, to do that, we need to go out to at least 1 million people in the country because half of the people wouldn't really want to talk with us because you have to have a handwritten signatures. And out of these 500,000, about half again would say, yes, we support this idea. The others would say, no, no, we are against, we want to keep the army. And again, out of the 250,000, about half would dare to sign, because at that time, this was really like almost uh, treasury, I mean, uh, uh, treason. Uh, that was seen as some go against Switzerland. The Swiss government, before the vote, made a statement, Switzerland has no army, it is an army. So at that time, we, with this initiative, were very much seen as, as a, a little bit like a disturbing factor, but we were not really serious. But what we got through this tool was that we got a national vote, we got a national debate, and we had the good luck that this vote was happening two weeks after the Berlin Wall was falling down. So two weeks after that, on the 26th November 1989, we had a vote. Uh, we were, would say about 5 to 10 percent would, would support that. We got almost 36 percent. 70 percent of the young people voted in favor of that. And that was an earthquake. And that was also when 
group was called the highest losers in history. And that was also the experience for me that in a good democracy, in a democracy where your voice is not ending by having a vote, but you can continuously start and start again with new proposals, you can always be a decision maker again, you can be happy without always winning. And this is in fact, of course, a factor most Swiss experience, because you, it's not always the same people, the same groups, the same parties who are winning votes, it's very, very diverse. There are coalitions between mountainers and, and lowlanders, between Catholics and, and, and Protestants, between French speakers, Italian speakers. So you have all the time different kind of coalitions and this brings the country in a way together which you can say is based on a democratic constitutional patriotism which most Swiss would share. And uh, I think this has been a very important experience, not only for me, but for a whole generation in Switzerland. And it also helped us to really go out to many other places around Europe and the world. In fact, during this campaign, I was very often in the neighboring countries, in Italy, in Austria, in Germany, and I would talk about this initiative. And most people would say, we didn't even know that you have an army in Switzerland. So the interest was all about democratic too. But what I also want to show a little bit is that democracy is never finished. It's never uh, perfect. You can always add new tools. In Switzerland, we uh, introduced, for instance, the mandatory voting on treaties. Uh, we introduced e-voting on the internet. We introduced different forms which make the decision-making process more democratic. And the popular referendum, as I said uh, 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 before, has a very special function as a break towards the government, towards the parliament, towards the political parties, if they are overreaching, if they are doing things which mo most people don't like. And about 5% of all legislation is put to a vote, and about half of them are then voted down. So it's a minority of the issues, but it's an important reminder for the politicians and the parliament to be very, very inclusive when they make the law. Secondly, the, European, uh, the citizen initiative uh, is a very different uh, animal because it's over a long time. From starting an initiative to having a final vote, it may take five to six years. So it's a, on one side, accelerator of the political system, but also one with a very long span, where you need a lot of, 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 of uh, let's say, patience, but also strategic thinking. But it allows even smaller groups of people to propose issues nobody else would propose. So it enriches the democratic system very much. And this picture just shows you about the, the, the the, the, the normality of this process. In fact, this is a calendar which is now already, uh, we can see, to 2043. We know all the dates of all the votes coming up in the next 25 years. So uh, it's, uh, it's not about guessing when could there be another referendum. We know exactly, for instance, 2024, 3rd of March, 9th of June, 22nd of September, 24th of November, we will have the right to vote. We will have the right to decide. And this creates, of course, also a stability, a, a conviction that one truly lives in a democracy, which is far from perfect, but which allows us the rights to be in the game. Now, how to work with these issues around the world? I said before that uh, when we had this initiative about Switzerland without an army, there was a lot of interest coming in. And a lot of people in Switzerland and others who are discussed that, we understood that we need to work, not just in favor of democracy, but we need to work to make democracies more democratic around the world on a continuous basis. And this made us, in many different contexts, to be much more attentive, to look into what's going on around the world. Where do you have such tools? And in fact, we developed something called the Navigator to Direct Democracy, which is a database, a unique database, which gives all the tools available on 
direct democracy on all levels around the world in constitutions, legislations, regulations. And it's very interesting to see that looking and going through all the constitution legal provisions around the world, you see that more than 100 countries worldwide do have forms of direct democracy in their constitutions, legislation, but in most cases these are uh, dead letters. They are not usable, user-friendly. They cannot be used. They have too high hurdles. They uh, give too short time. They exclude a lot of issues. So in many, many countries where the struggle and the fight for the idea of democracy and direct democracy haven't really been able to use it because, for instance, again, the politicians or the parliaments weren't interested to implement these principles into legislation. So by introducing direct democracy in the principle, you are far from having a good procedure and you are even further away from a reasonable practice. And this makes it so challenging. But at, at the same time, by knowing this, by knowing about these principles, by knowing about these agreements at some point in history, we have, of course, much a better handle vis-a-vis -vis those who are not in favor of that to really work and to take this claim seriously. At the Direct Democracy Navigator, which is uh, openly available under this website, really gives you all these details, really gives you a unique insight into what's going on. I mean, looking into that and looking into the different countries, I mean, it's fascinating, for instance, to see that Mexico is the country which has direct democratic rights on all national le on all levels, local, regional, national, but have a magnitude of different kind of forms of direct democracy in their different states. So when we earlier this year had a big forum in Mexico, different places in Mexico, we learned so much about the struggle of the Mexican people on the local, regional, national level for their democracies. And of course, many people would say Mexico is a very violent democracy. That's true, but it's also a democracy where people are extremely engaged and very, very eager to make their democracy stronger. I mean, we have the traditional two federal states of the US and Switzerland, but even Germany is an interesting example because as you can see in Germany, there are very few tools of direct democracy on the national level. In the US, not even one, but on the state and the regional level in Germany since 1990, since the, re, uh, 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 the reunification of Germany, all states and all municipalities have developed and introduced this kind of form. So Germany has been a powerhouse, in fact, of demo direct democratic development. Other countries which have a lot are Italy, Brazil, Argentine, and Austria. But there's a lot of this kind of experiences to be learned. So this in a way, is one fundamental element to look into when you want democracy stronger, is to reconnect this decision-making process with the people and the people with decision-making process. Because there cannot be a democracy when you just can applaud, say yes or no to those who make the decisions. You need to have possibilities and rights to be involved directly. Now, the second big part of the experience of democratic development is about how governments are constituted and what local and subnational governments have a role into. And this brings us basically back to the history, to the birth of democracy as such, because democracy, as you, many of us, of course, are conscious about, has been born in the city-state of uh, Old Creek, where uh, a few men, but uh, at that time still more of the a bigger group than it was in dictatorships, of course, were able to make decisions. Many of those city-states introduced a lot of interesting forms of democracy, but this is maybe less interesting than the principle which was introduced. And this is very much linked to this statesman called Pericles. He said something very important. He said, in a democracy, in contrast to all other forms of government, in a democracy, decisions are foregone by dialogue among them, uh, among them who are 
covered by this decision. That means that a legal provision, a decision being made, be foregone with a dialogue in which those who have to follow this decision have a, say, have a possibility to influence. So I think this quality, this power of dialogue, this power of conversation, this makes the whole change, the whole difference of, of government systems, because all other systems, all other forms of government basically guarantee that minorities rule over the majorities. It's only in a democracy where you don't have this guarantee. Of course, we have many democratic systems where still minorities are ruling, and you know that better than me. But what is ex extremely exciting with this perspective of local governments and local developments is that while we have maybe 200 independent states, uh, members of the UN worldwide, we have more than 1.5 million local governments around the world. So many different places and forms of democracy can be developed. So many uh, new ideas are, 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 are happening there and so much democratic belief and experience can be learned on the local level because it's on the local level where we, we live, where we see, where we meet in person, not just as a, a, a spectator job on local government, on local level, we have the chance to be true active citizens when we are also allowed to be involved in the, in the process. But as we know, uh, local governments look very different around the world, especially they have very different preconditions. This is a little graph which is hard to catch, but it simply shows that you have countries in the world where local governments manage and raise the majority of taxes and common funding, while others, and there are many of those, and the UK is among them, local government has almost no financial taxing and, uh, and, and governing powers. And this is a very important factor. You can have the best local democracy, but if you have no funds to, 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 to work with, if you have no financial means to, to govern with, of course, this is more a nice exercise than a real practice. So it's very important to look into the capacity of local governments finance-wise, but also link them to the democratic practices, because we can show that, for instance, in Switzerland, United States, that local governments, where the people have a lot to say, where direct democracy works very well, these local governments do best. They have the, the least of tax evasion. They have the, 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 the best wealth distribution, because closely and easily understandable, they are working in the interest of the people on the spot. As I said, myself, I was eight years in a city government in Sweden. In a, in a city called Falun, uh, which some of you may know as a, as a, as a ski uh, place. Um, in this place, I had the chance to develop uh, the democratic infrastructure during eight years. We introduced, for instance, as one of the first steps uh, to uh, publish a democracy passport to all students, to all uh, inhabitants, to all interested people to easily explain which political levels they are living in, in they are citizens in, because many people didn't got it really which are the decisions made on local level, which are made on the regional, national, European level. So this passport showed everybody the space of democratic uh, activities and rights in their different uh, contexts. And it was an educative tool to also explain for instance, how much money is dealt with on the local, regional, national, European level, how things are put together, and where you can get support for, for your activity. Because oftentimes I, I see and I understand that there is a lack of information education to the people of a country, which rights they do have, and which possibilities they in fact have. Most often there are more rights, more possibilities than people are conscious about, even administrations are willing to share with. So what we also did was we established a unit in the city for uh, uh, democracy uh, support, which means there were a couple of people only 
task to help people who want to make their voice heard, to guide them, to navigate them through the system. And this uh, was done, and this was very important in my mind, in, um, in a consensus with all the political parties in city government, in the city council. We had nine different parties. So I put a lot of efforts in bringing all these parties together to have a common denominator, common, common strate strategy. Because what we also often see is that democratic reforms, important uh, developments are made with simple majorities, which means that if you have a change of power, a change of the mayor, a change of the majority in, in, in government, you go back to what you had before because those who were in opposition don't like what those who are in government are doing. And for a democracy, it's very important that there is a common fundamental understanding. Why should we together develop democracy forward? We got quite some interest and we got quite some, 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 some conversations with other places around the world. And out of these initiatives, out of this work, there were several things which were developed. One of the things, one of the initiatives which have been uh, uh, done out of that is the process of having every year a European capital of democracy. It's a very new initiative where cities can apply uh, under uh, a, a, a big set of, of, of criteria to explain what are they doing good, where do they want to become better, and what is not in their competence. And the first European capital of democracy, in fact, is uh, starting its so-called program year in a few weeks. It's Barcelona in Spain. And for instance, next week I will visit uh, Gdansk in Poland. And uh, we will also have cities like Tirana and Izmir. And this shows you that even in countries where democracy on the national level is not in a good shape, there can be local regional governments who are doing quite well, who can be the birthplace for stronger democracy even on the national level. And we also developed uh, in the frameworks of different conferences and of the Global Forum on Modern Direct Democracy uh, 20 criteria for a democracy city, which is called the Magna Carta for an International League of Democracy Cities, and many cities have subscribed to that. And as a third practical step, we are now developing something called a, a global planetary platform for uh, democracy local stories, a journalistic project where my colleague, uh, Joe Matthews, where is he? Where is Joe? There is Joe. Uh, is in fact the, the initiator, and uh, he will be able afterwards to tell you more about that. The idea is there that we are sharing stories of democratic practices from around the, wor around the world to the whole world. Because it's again, it's like people explaining to people, people encouraging people, and local democracies encouraging local democracies around the world. I think there we have a lot uh, of possibilities. So Joe is there, and he was even is me, with me here now. Having said that, the third big question is about genuine democratic sovereignty, and that means to me enormously a lot because it's so much about the heart of the very idea of democracy. And it's also, we have to say today, it's very much at stake because what we see today is that more and more regimes, parties, groups are openly questioning the fundamental principles and procedures of democracy. They are attacking them. They are undermining freedom of opinion, freedom of press, freedom of assembly, as we know, also attacking them on the war field. And sovereignty is a, a concept which means self-determination. And it's, of course, a non-exclusive concept because it is enabled and enshrined in the people. And people can, as I just had uh, discussed before or, or said with this democracy passport, we are citizens on different levels. We are sovereign citizens maybe in our cities, but we can be on the, on a, on a, or in, a, in, a, in a regional council, on a national level, or even on a European Union level. But this picture, for instance, is from, from Canberra, uh, outside uh, the, the Australian capital, where the, the, the indigenous people, since 30 years 
are camping outside Parliament to claim their sovereignty. They have their so-called permanent embassy outside Parliament in 30 years. These are two of the leaders of it, which is based on the sovereignty of the people because, as you may know, Australia has a very bad colonial history and a very hard uh, uh, way of accepting that there are people who have lived before uh, the first colonists came about 250 years ago. And now in the middle of October, as you have may heard, there will be a national vote in Australia, the so-called voice to parliament, which shall enshrine the indigenous voice in the national parliament in the constitution. It will be very hard because Australia is a very interesting example because Australia basically imported three different principles of democracy when they established the constitution in 1901. First, the British one, the election system of, 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 of the United Kingdom, first past the vote, uh, very confrontative. Secondly, the idea of two chambers with the states and Senate as a federal system, which in Australian case, in contrast, for instance, to US and Switzerland, is much harder because there are so few states. That means in a national referendum, you need the majority of the people, but also majority of the states. And if you have only seven states, of course, it's very easy that there is a confrontation between these states. And it, it's very easy that the, there is a, a failing referendum. And in fact, it's more than 50 years ago in Australia that they were able to amend the constitution. And thirdly, uh, uh, the, the Swiss idea of direct democracy through the uh, referendum and uh, this is now uh, the case. So these three systems were put together. I would say they don't really work as they should because they don't allow, as it seems, to have constitutional amendments and they don't allow the native people of Australia to really get their voice because when there is the government proposing that, the opposition would say, no, 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 we don't like that. We don't let you win this referendum. The last time such a thing happened was in 1999 when uh, it was the vote about the Republic. And what is more important even when it comes to really understand sovereignty is of course that there cannot be, as it has been said initially, sovereignty without democracy. I mean, there can be, there can be so-called uh, sovereign states, sovereign territories, but they, if they don't have to do with uh, democracy, they are basically weapons in the hand of a few. What for me is always and really important, exactly at this time now, when we are heading to the 10th of December uh, this year, we will celebrate the 75th anniversary uh, of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which in a way, based on the devastations of the Second World War, really tried to shift from the idea of national sovereignty to popular sovereignty, in a way that universal so, uh, human rights include the individual as part of the collective bodies, which gives the individual rights and possibilities to be part of the decision-making process. This is in fact enshrined in Article 21, which says that everyone has the right to be part in the government of his country, directly, or through freely chosen representatives. Which means that even the idea of direct democracy is part of the universal human rights, where you can see that the direct participation is the principle, is the first principle, and of course, in many ways, in practical senses, it makes sense to have uh, freely chosen representatives for many decisions, but they, these decisions need to be checked. This is, in a way, what we got as a principle. But when we look now, of course, what's going on in the world, when we see that basically uh, one of the biggest, the biggest country in the world uh, is leading some, something you could call a third world war against democracy by invading a neighbor country, by basically not only seeing this war as a, as a war against a, another country and taking its territory, but basically against all the fundamental principles of international law and fundamental rights of the Human Rights Declaration. So we see worldwide a big, big backsliding of democratic spaces, 
But we also see that this creates a wake-up call to many people to take democracy more serious, to stand up for democracy, to protest for democracy. Many countries where autocrats try to undermine democracy, people go out on the streets, they stand up, they try to push back to become, let's say, smarter, better, and more strategic Democrats. But the world doesn't look very nice when it comes to the the division of, 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 of democracy. And still, I would say, there are a lot of possibilities, especially now, looking into the next year, in 2024, we will have basically uh, elections in all the bigger democratic states, more or less democratic states. We will have elections in Indonesia, in India, European Union, United States, uh, South Africa, Mexico. Countries, including about four billion people, will go to the polls next year. And this is, of course, again, you can say, an invitation to look into how these elections work, how can we improve democracies in these countries. And that brings me back to Scotland to you and what you have done today. I mean, I really follow with great, great interest how you are doing your best in bringing democracy to this country and making Scotland truly democratic. The big challenge you obviously have is this kind of pillars of, of, of decision-making which are, in fact, as a system in, in the United Kingdom, just the opposition just the contrary of a bottom-up democratic system where the local, the regional, instructs the national how to behave, where the government and the parliament can advise the people and not vice versa. I mean, uh, the exercise this morning showed quite well that uh, established in this country where not even an official uh, uh, comes out to receive what you, what you want to deliver. That's, of course... Uh, really a shame. But I think by addressing these issues, by looking into the opportunities, uh, you will be able, and I'm sure many of you are contributing a lot to that, and I think that's the way uh, we are going, to a more happy Scotland, stronger Scotland, and a democratic and sovereign Scotland. And now we can together discuss the next steps. Thank you very much.